how can there be morality if we all just came from animals? And I think that's the point. I think that's where evolution comes from. And that's why I just believe in six days. I think if anything, you could make the argument that evolution is an incredibly racist theory at heart. Is the earth only 6,000 years old? In Exodus chapter 20, verse eight, we read, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. And then in verse 11, for in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. Boy, it sure sounds a lot like Moses thought God created the world in six literal days. He even patterned our work week after this. Of course, this in theology is what we refer to as a creation ordinance in terms of our work week, in terms of the way God created. And so there's a lot of weight put historically on this idea of six literal days. But it's a little bit of a complex issue because with the advent of modern science and people questioning old ages to the earth, there has been some debate on, is this literal? Is it figurative? And then you've got this whole issue of evolution that some people try to fit in there. Of course, I am not a big proponent of evolution at all. And uh, there's reasons for that. I actually look at what's called flood geology, which is basically the geologic column it's all those little pancake layers where you find the fossils, uh, you know, in, in the dirt there. And uh, a lot of people don't know. They actually find soft tissue in the dinosaur bones. They find carbon-14 in fossil fuels in dinosaurs and in uh, diamonds, things like that. Uh, this would contradict long ages, old ages for the earth. And so, so there's reasons I don't believe in evolution. I think there's also been a lack of credible evidence for missing links between species. There is also uh, stasis in the fossil record. There's a great deal of, of stasis, which basically means things haven't changed at all for millions and millions up, up to uh, and including 450 million years. Supposedly, I don't take those dates, but, uh, but there's, there's reasons, I guess, scientifically that I am a, uh, I, I don't believe in evolution. So setting the issue of evolution aside for a moment, we come to Genesis chapter one. And it's kind of crazy, but you actually have some Christians who uh, are, they don't believe in evolution like I don't, but then for some reason they, they still believe that Genesis chapter one is figurative, that it's metaphorical. And uh, I think one of the things that we have to understand when we look at this issue is that typically, people believe in old ages because they want to find a way to fit evolution into the Bible. And so uh, kind of keeping that in mind, uh, it just it's just sort of helpful because you'll hear some Christians say, I believe that the earth is old, but I don't believe in evolution. Well, uh, one of the reasons people date the earth so old is because they look at the rocks, the geologic column, the flood geology, and they want to say that the earth is old because of that. So I think uh, there's different layers to the discussion. So you take geology out of it, which I think we should, at least for this conversation, because I, I think geology uh, lends to evidence for a young earth. Uh, you, you've got to look at the laws of physics. I think there's, there's other things like how does distant starlight reach us from supposedly millions or billions or trillions of light years away? And uh, in that. So there is also uh, problems on the secular front with what's called the Big Bang because uh, they don't have enough time to account for light reaching us, even in the Big Bang model. Uh, surprisingly, a lot of people don't realize that. So the problem, the same problem exists for what we would call young earth creationists that exists for the scientific community and people who just adhere to uh, old ages of the earth. I personally don't believe that there's anything that contradicts a literal six-day interpretation of Genesis chapter 1. I think historically that is how the ancients uh, unequivocally would have, ha would have interpreted that passage. I don't think there would have been any other frame of mind for them to interpret it in, unless you go later in, I guess, Israel's history where they were, you know, mingling with the Greeks a little bit who tended to believe that the earth was eternal and the universe was eternal. Ironically, people don't even believe that today. So uh, the point I just wanted to make is that some of these things that people suggest today actually come out of pre-existing assumptions about earth and its history. So all of that to say, I was recently watching a video by Ruslan where he 
breaks down Michael Jones from Inspiring Philosophy and a video that he recently produced where he asserts uh, that basically young earth creationism is more of a modern phenomena. So um, obviously I disagree with that. Uh, as somebody who's, who's an academic, I went all the way through. If you don't know this about me, I got my doctoral degree um, uh, in ministry. Obviously I'm not a scientist. This has been a little bit of a hobby horse of mine for the last, uh, I don't know, 20 or 30 years. I went into ministry when I was 22 years old. I'm uh, 45 now. I just turned 45 a couple weeks ago. So, so I've studied this quite a bit and I just wanted to lend my comments to what I believe is an incredibly slanted presentation of historical facts and science. So I will put links to both of these videos in the description and let's take a look at what he has to say. Many people today think that the belief that the earth is 6,000 years old is an essential belief of Christianity, that the Bible teaches that the earth is young, and some Christians only started to reinterpret Genesis after modern scientific advances demonstrated that the earth was billions of years old. Okay, so this is somewhat true. I, I wouldn't necessarily characterize history in this way, but, uh, but, it, but I, I think that this is for, most, for the most part a true statement that uh, you, you could look at evolution and the history of evolution and see that people really did start in the mid 1800s to reinterpret the Bible with these uh, extended ages of millions and billions of years. So, uh, so true statement. But you might be surprised to find out that this is a caricature of the truth. And Several Christians in the that's past not a true statement. didn't believe the earth was necessarily young. And some that did, Still interpreting Genesis four listed figuratively there. or allegorically. In fact, the modern Young Earth movement is relatively new and has a peculiar origin many people are not aware of. That's not true. The National Center for Science Education defines Young Earth creationism as the idea which requires that the Earth be no more than 10,000 years old and that the six days of creation described in Genesis each lasted for 24 hours. Okay, so he's putting some parameters here on uh, what young earth creationism is supposed to be, or uh, I guess is, is limiting it in, in this way. I don't think young earth creationists, uh, it, it, and me being one of those uh, who interprets Genesis chapter one, literally, in terms of six days, I, bl I believe that God created in six days in the order in which he did in the Bible. But I, I don't think that young earth creationists like myself look at uh, Genesis chapter one and go, okay, the earth has to be between six and 10,000 years old. It can't be 10,000 and one years old. It has to be exactly 10,000. I, I think the, those, stin those kind of really stingent parameters that, uh, that are placed on that uh, aren't necessarily accurate because that's not the way I or other young earth creationists look at it. We just look at the evidence of the earth being young in terms of the fossil record, the geologic column. There's a lot of evidence for that. There's soft tissue and things. So the earth can't be more than 50,000 years old, uh, 100,000 years old. In terms of the geologic column, it, it can't be that old. So we're not necessarily pigeonholed to 10,000 years. It's just that uh, it seems like when you look at the Bible, if you want to not interpret any gaps in the lineages listed, that it's probably six to 10,000 years old. So that's, that's where that comes from. This is what we see with modern young earth creationist organizations. Answers in Genesis states on their website that creation took place in 4,000 BC. organization. BC. Creation Ministries International and the Institute for Creation Research also have articles on their Two website. Two more solid organizations. That the earth is roughly 6,000 years old. I have encountered see, some roughly. young earth creationists who state that the world is a bit older based on a literal reading of the Greek Septuagint, but they still tend to fall into the definition of stating that the earth is less than 10,000 years old. And most seem to state that it's roughly 6,000 years old. And the common belief among many non-Christians today is that this is how Christians read the Bible until modern science demonstrated that the earth was 4.6 billion years old. Answers in True statement. Also True statement. But again, space. modern science didn't website, prove Dr. or James show Arnold that writes, the earth is 4.6 billion years old. What did the early church old. believe about creation? In its first 16 centuries, the church held to a young earth. Earth was several thousand years old was created quickly in six 24-hour days and was later submerged under a worldwide flood. Yes, it was. Moot goes on to contradict himself by listing Christians from the past that did not hold to this interpretation. And additionally, when we dive into the history, we can see there were more Christians than even he acknowledges. Many Christians, long before the advent of modern geology and biology, didn't read the days of Genesis literally, and some allowed for the Earth to be older than 10,000 years old. 
Okay, so this is where he launches into a segment of this video in order to show that there are church fathers. And we're talking about people, uh, Christians, living like around 200 AD, 300 AD, 400 AD, 500 AD. These were, relatively speaking, leaders within the church at its early stages for its first few hundred years. And so what he's trying to do is show that some of these people didn't believe in a 6,000-year-old earth. So one of the things that you have to keep in mind is that there is a gross difference between believing that the earth is 6,000 or 10,000 or 12,000 years old, because Irenaeus may or may not have thought that each day of the creation week was actually a thousand years. He wasn't doing that because of apparent age in the rock strata. He was doing it because of the Greeks who thought that the earth was eternal. Yet he seems to come around to a literal six-day creation. So my point is that it seems like he's cherry-picking a handful of early church fathers who might have believed that the earth is 10,000 or 12,000 years old, and using that as a liberty to impose millions or billions of years, which we've seen very recently in history, in the modern age of the last 150 years or, years or so since Darwin and his forerunners. So what I'm trying to say is that the, you can't connect the dots on these things. It's not an apples to apples comparison because Origen may have interpreted Genesis allegorically. It doesn't mean that, oh, well, the church fathers didn't hold to an exact 6,000 years. So therefore we can believe in millions or billions of years and the icing on the cake of evolution. I don't think any of these things were on their mind until the last 150 years or so. Many people today think that the belief that the earth is 6,000 years old is in, a, in the second century AD, St. Irenaeus of Lyons wrote a book responding to Gnostic heretics. The various Gnostic sects believe the God of the Old Testament is a different God from Jesus. It was not actually the ultimate creator of all things. Often they would argue that God was evil and lied to Adam and Eve. Because the Gnostics read Genesis 2 to mean that God told Adam that if they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that Adam would die the same day he ate of it. Thus interpreting the word for day to mean a literal 24 hour day. But in Genesis 3, it is clear Adam and Eve did not die on the same day that they ate from the tree. Saint Irenaeus responded by stating that the days in Genesis were not literal 24-hour days, by drawing from 2 Peter 3.8, where it says a day is a thousand years to the Lord. Since Adam did not live more than a thousand years, God did not lie when he said Adam would die on the same day that he ate. However, St. Irenaeus also states he thought the days of Genesis 1 were also 1,000-year periods. For in as many days as this world was made, in so many thousand years shall it be concluded. And for this reason the scripture says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their adornment. And God brought to a conclusion upon the sixth day the works that he had made, and God rested upon the seventh day from all his works. This is an account of the things formerly created, as also it is a prophecy of what is to come. For the day of the Lord is as a thousand years, and in six days created things were completed. It is evident, therefore, that they will come to an end at the 6,000 year. Okay, so this is exactly what I'm talking about. Taking a church father, Irenaeus, and ascribing to him old ages or long ages. I, I also think there might be a little bit of an interpretation issue here because I don't think Irenaeus is actually saying that the earth is 12,000 years old, which I would say is very different from saying it's 4 billion years old. It seems like he's actually saying that each day in Genesis represents a thousand years of prophecy. In other words, the earth will end with Christ's return once the earth is 6,000 years old and enter a period of rest, just like God rested on the seventh day. So I don't think Irenaeus is actually interpreting Genesis allegorically so much as he's interpreting it literally and then looking at its literal seven-day creation week as a prophecy for the future, pointing to the time when Christ will return. In addition to that, another interesting thing to consider when you're looking at the patristics and some of these early church fathers is that they oftentimes held straight-up unbiblical beliefs. Uh, Irenaeus, for example, believed that Jesus had to be over 50 years old because he had too much wisdom to say and do the things that he did. 
Clearly, the scriptures teach Jesus was about 30 when he started his public ministry. And so not just with Irenaeus, but also with Origen, and even with the great St. Augustine, you do see some unbiblical concepts come in, just like you would with any modern-day theologian. Nobody has a completely tight and perfect theology, because we are all held captive to the culture in which we live. I think this was the case with Irenaeus. It was the case especially in that time period, because what you see is the church really starting to engage with the overall Greek and Latin cultures in which they had some of these beliefs. This is even more reason for us to look to what the authors of the actual Bible believed, because I don't think there's any way in the mind of the ancient Hebrew that they would have interpreted Genesis chapter 1 any way other than a literal six 24-hour periods. And that is the culture to which we have to look for our interpretation. This cannot be emphasized enough. The Bible is not a Gnostic document. It is Hebrew. It is Jewish through and through. Even the New Testament was written by Jews. And that New Testament teaches us that we Gentiles have been grafted in to God's people. So the issue isn't what did Irenaeus think, even though he didn't hold to millions and billions of years, or St. Augustine, or anybody else, but what did the actual authors of Scripture think? And in that regard, it's impossible for me to imagine that Peter, or Paul, or Moses, who wrote the Scripture I started off with today, for in six days, The Lord made the heavens and the earth. I think Jesus himself, who was the creative hand of God, saw things in this same light. Irenaeus thought that each day of creation was a thousand years, meaning on his view, the earth would be roughly 12,000 years. Technically speaking, he would not qualify as a young earth creationist, since he states the age of the earth was over 10,000 years, but only in So again here, we don't see this sharp distinction of 10,000 years, and that's why I tried to suggest that to begin with. He's basically lumping Irenaeus in with someone who ascribes an old age to the earth because he says Irenaeus believed the earth to be 12,000 years old. 12,000 is a lot different than 4 billion. 12,000, I'm going to say Irenaeus was a young earth creationist by today's standards, taking Genesis chapter 1 very literally. And again, I think he misinterprets Irenaeus' words to begin with. It seems like Irenaeus believed the earth to be 6,000 years old. In a technical sense. However, the important point to take away from this is St. Irenaeus didn't think one had to interpret the days of Genesis 1 as literal 24-hour days, meaning the chapter was open to interpretation in the 2nd century AD. It doesn't necessarily have to mean the earth is only 6,000 years old. And St. Irenaeus is not alone in this understanding. St. Justin Martyr also seems to agree on this reading of the days as being 1,000 years. Holding to a different interpretation, Clement of Alexandria also did not believe that creation took place in six 24-hour days. He seemed to have believed all things were created instantly in the past, and that the days of Genesis 1 are figurative, ordering which creations were the most important to God. The longer the day, the more important whatever was listed on that day. Clement may have gotten this interpretation from a contemporary of Jesus. The Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria also advocated for an instantaneous creation and that the days of Genesis 1 were figurative. This instantaneous interpretation of Genesis was also promoted by other church fathers like St. Athanasius the Great, Origen, St. Augustine, and others. St. Augustine taught the days of Genesis 1 were not sun-divided days. So was it instant or was it millions of years and billions of years. There's a little bit of cherry picking going on here in terms of the church fathers he's utilizing and even the beliefs that they held. But God divided days. And I don't say this to be rude. I just say it by way of argument to show what are contradictions in this presentation. Because I do think it's important when we're debating to give an accurate portrayal of what the other side thinks and believes, as well as the history involved that you're using to support your argument and that all six days of Genesis 1 are called one day in Genesis 2-4, where it states, in the day that the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. Thus the days, according to his reading of Genesis 1 and 2, were not literal 24-hour days. It follows, therefore, that he, who created all things together, simultaneously created these six days, or seven, or rather the one day, six or seven times repeated. Why, then, was there any need for the six distinct days to be set forth in the narrative one after the other? The reason is that those who cannot understand the meaning of the text, he created all things together, 
cannot arrive at the meaning of scripture unless the narrative proceeds solely step by step. In other words, St. Augustine believed the days of Genesis 1 were not six 24-hour days, but part of the narrative structure of Genesis 1. So one didn't have to take Genesis 1 to be explaining how creation literally happened. Now these early church fathers, who believed in an instantaneous creation, and took Genesis 1 figuratively, were still technically young earth creationists, since they didn't stay more there than 6,000 years old. But the point being, they didn't have to hold to the idea that the earth was 6,000 years old because of a plain or literal reading of Genesis 1. There were different ways to interpret the chapter where it was read figuratively. Now, see, I think he shoots himself in the foot a little bit here because he's saying on one hand, the church fathers interpreted the Bible metaphorically. I think he's trying to suggest that it's okay to ascribe long ages, very old ages, extremely old ages to the earth today because we live in a an advanced scientific world. But on the other hand, he's saying the early church fathers were basically young earth creationists by our standards. So, I mean, he's kind of shooting himself in the foot. The belief one can have a non-literal reading of Genesis isn't a modern idea. It was present in the days of the early church fathers. Non-literal readings of Genesis didn't disappear in the Middle Ages. William of Conscious, for example, advocated for a non-literal reading of Genesis as well. In fact, he went so far as to argue that Adam was not instantaneously created from dust. Instead, he argued the underlying truth being taught in the passage was that humans could possibly have come about from natural elements working together. So in his view, Genesis 2 was possibly suggesting humanity could have come about from a natural process that God imbued in creation. Robert Grustest followed St. Augustine in believing the six days of Genesis Grustest. were metaphorical. His view was that God created light and matter, which would then over time bring about the rest of creation. This is not to say this was okay. the dominant view in the Middle Ages. Historian Michael Roberts says, in 1550, Few questioned the biblical age of the earth. Isaac Newton and Johannes Kepler were two who agreed with the famous Bishop Usher that the date of creation was only around 4000 BC. However, at the time, the scientific research was very limited on the investigation of the age of the earth. Okay, so this is where I think the bias comes through a little bit because he is admitting that this has to do with scientific discoveries and that we are reinterpreting scripture based on a modern scientific understanding because Newton and Kepler were scientists, by the way, along with a plethora of other people throughout Western history before Darwin's origin of the species that were young earth creationists. So is young earth creationism a modern phenomena or isn't it? I think looking at Michael Jones's video in the best light possible, it's like he's telling us that he's convinced of evolution and billions of years. And yes, these beliefs are based upon recent scientific discoveries, historically speaking. But even though everyone else throughout history didn't in terms of Western Christendom, I can cherry pick a few people for you that fudged Genesis 1 just a little bit on the figurative side. So therefore I can believe in evolution. That's how I'm interpreting his logic here. These men held to these dates because the research of the time supported it. Michael Roberts puts it like this. Since before 1760, there was little in the way of evidence for an ancient earth. It is as absurd to cavil at Usher, Calvin or Aquinas for not dating the earth at 4.6 billion years as to cavil at Darwin for not knowing about genetics. Okay, so it wasn't just Kepler and Usher. No one throughout Christian history interpreted billions of years, extrapolated billions of years from the text. But even before the rise of modern geology or astronomy, Roberts notes there was a great diversity in how theologians interpreted Genesis. In yeah. fact, Bishop Usher's notorious date was never official doctrine. Reier Huikas noted that John Calvin's accommodating commentary on Genesis allowed for many later Protestants to accept the findings of the sciences that were to come. Calvin stressed Genesis was not a book on astronomy and that Moses accommodated himself to the limitations of human understanding of the time. Apart from this, many Christians from this time period also began promoting something similar to the gap interpretation of Genesis. When Genesis reads that the earth was without form and void, Many saw this as an unspecified amount of time of chaos that was created by God while the earth existed. Then God reworked the chaos of the earth into creation in six days. Okay, so this would be wrong if you interpret it to mean that there was a world that was in chaos for millions or billions of years because God brought 
order. And from the moment that God spoke, he was bringing things into existence ex nihilo, out of nothing. God did not bring things into existence and just leave them to sit there in disarray and disorder for millions or billions of years. And there probably is an interesting discussion to be had at this point on the nature of the laws of physics. Because like I said, there's a lot of people who don't believe in evolution, but they just believe that the universe is old because of distant starlight or other things. And that's fine. Like I said, this is not an essential issue. You're saved because you believe in Genesis chapter 3 that there was a fall, you are a sinner, and God in the fullness of time provided a redeemer in the person of Jesus Christ. That's what saves a person. I would argue that not taking Genesis 1 literally, especially as it applies to theistic evolution or the belief that God guided the evolutionary process, undercuts the theology of the Bible that sin brought death into the world. Because you have a narrative where death existed long before sin was in the picture. And the Bible clearly says that God created things good. But just within the realm of old age, apart from evolutionary processes, I still don't think it's reasonable to assume, and nor does science mandate, that we take a figurative approach to Genesis. You can argue that any other person throughout history who's done this was simply trying to accommodate the worldly thought processes or in some cases, the pagan cultures of their time period. Whereas the ancient Israelites would never in a million years, no pun intended, have thought that Genesis 1 was anything other than literal. There wouldn't have been a compartment for it in their worldview. Just that this period of chaos was millions of years. Some like Thomas Burnett even added that the six days of creation were periods of 1,000 years rather than literal 24-hour days. William Hobbes suggested the days of creation could have been unspecified periods. This was known as the chaos restitution interpretation, and it was the dominant view of the time, even accepted by men such as Immanuel Kant, John Wesley, and John Milton. Robert says, the chaos restitution interpretation was adopted by most commentators in the 18th century. By the time the science of geology was developing and revealing the earth was billions of years old, very few theologians actually opposed this idea. Bishop Usher's date of creation had little influence on the church and was mostly ignored. Most believe the discoveries of geology were completely compatible with Genesis. In fact, Nicholas Rupke notes historical geology countered the eternalism of Enlightenment deism, and in particular, the theory of an eternal present expressed in the famous maxim of the Scottish naturalist James Hutton, we find no vestige of a beginning. So Christians not only embraced geology, they used it to refute anti-Christian ideas of an eternal earth without a beginning point. In fact, Rupke goes on to note the ironic point that some of the arguments used by Charles Lyell to promote his steady state model of the earth were picked up and used by young earth creationists to attack modern geology. By 1785, Reverend James Douglas promoted that the earth was created in six expanses of time instead of six days. And in 1865, Reverend Richard Maine wrote, some school books still teach to the ignorant that the earth is 6,000 years old. No well-educated person of the present day shares that delusion. At this point in history, very few Christians who had left writings behind held to a young earth creationist view. So there were people who had this viewpoint before Darwin? Because it sounds like what he's going to get into in a moment here, this is more of a very recent phenomena in history. But it kind of seems like, based on what he just said, it's the other way around. We're open to a slightly longer time scale, long before geological evidence was apparent. Despite the date of 4004 BC being in many English Bibles, a strict six-day creation was never the dominant view and was the official position of no church in Europe or America until the late 20th century. Recent studies also point out that most but early you just Christian said that it responses wasn't. to Darwin were not because of a literal reading of Genesis. In fact, many Christians saw no conflict between a theory of evolution and Genesis. Botanist Asa Gray promoted Darwinian evolution. James McCosh and James Dwight Dana also accepted evolution. The paleontologist Richard Owen and zoologist St. George Jackson of Art promoted their own form of theistic evolution. Theologian B.B. Warfield described himself as a pure Darwinist, as well as a Christian fundamentalist. Theistic evolutionist William Louis Pottiot, John Louis Kessler, and Lulu Pace 
worked to promote evolution in the American South and were pretty successful prior to the 1920s. Historian Ronald Numbers says, even in the conservative South, dominated culturally by Bible-believing Baptists, a number of church-related colleges had been teaching the theory of evolution for decades. Nicholas okay, so again, it was being taught or it wasn't being taught? Because I thought you said this was a modern phenomena. It sounds to me like evolution is the modern phenomena that's displacing what came before it. And I will again point out, it is grossly distinct from what you're calling an allegorical interpretation of just Genesis chapter 1 from a handful of people throughout history. It is indeed the novel evolution. Here's the thing. If you study how evolution came about, not just with Darwin, but with Hutton and with the people that were pushing this in our society, you find that their very intention was to separate science from the Bible and to dethrone Moses. Now, whether we're talking about science or culture at this point, I don't think anything good can come from having a slanted worldview whereby you are trying to disconnect geology, physics, or anything else from the book who tells us how it all came to be in the first place. Evolution is an incredibly biased worldview. Evolutionists paint Christians as being closed-minded, of being silly and mythological. But the truth is, the tenets of evolution and a lot of what modern science teaches are very religious. And you won't find many more religious people, by religious I mean paganism, than you will in the modern evolutionary community. Evolutionists have bullied our culture into embracing a worldview that undermines the Bible and promotes a culture of death in our civilization. Where do you think something like that comes from? And why is it that we feel like we have to accommodate what these people are telling us. No, I'm sorry, inspiring philosophy. Evolution in billions of years was absolutely not believed on by anyone before the origin of the species. And you can't cherry pick a few quotes, some of which came straight from the lips of unbelievers and say that it's okay to believe some of the things that we do today. Now, again, I'm not saying that someone's unsaved because they believe in evolution. I'm not saying that you're a scoffer or you're evil because you believe that the earth is old. You know why I believe in six literal days? Because of flood geology. Because flood geology shows us that at least all of the fossil bearing rock layers are young and that the world was once covered in water. Evolutionists believe this, by the way. And I think their view is a little more goofy because they believe in six global floods. I just believe in one. And there's a lot of reasons scientifically to take that view. You're not a bad person for believing these things. You're just absorbing the logic of the day, just like Irenaeus or some of the early fathers were interacting with the pagan worldview of theirs. There are some great men and church leaders who believe in evolution today, people that I look up to. But I would say on this issue, they're misguided. And I would also say that evolution has led to some real negative things in our culture. I say this as a parent. I say it as a person living in this world. Teaching young people that they came from animals severely undercuts not just Genesis chapter 1, not just the fact that we are sinners in need of a Savior, but it undercuts the very idea of morality. How can there be morality if we all just came from animals. And I think that's the point. I think that's where evolution comes from. And that's why I just believe in six days because the world told me at so many points that the Bible isn't true. And then a discovery would come along that would debunk what the skeptics were saying. So until further notice, not only have I rejected evolution, but I'm just gonna take God at his word until proven otherwise. And I just haven't seen anything to make me think otherwise yet. This Rupke says, by and large, mainstream Christian geologists and paleontologists succeeded in coming to terms with the new geology and evolutionary paleontology. Their reconciliation schemes provided space for scientific inquiry as well as for religious belief. Now, this is not to say there wasn't Christian opposition to evolution. There definitely was. You think? And many Christians rejected Darwin's theory. In the 1920s is when we begin to see organized resistance to evolution among Christians. But prior to the 1960s, these creationists didn't consider themselves 
See, see, but why is this? I, I think the reason you started to see this organized resistance is because there was a ground swelling. And this was a response eventually to this new novel idea that was being imposed on people who thought otherwise. Young earth creationists, Ronald Numbers says, even the most literalistic Bible believers accepted the antiquity of life on earth as revealed in the paleontological record. The Schofield Reference Bible, which is estimated to have sold more than 10 million copies, contained explanatory notes that Genesis 1 was really teaching a gap theory, which is the theory that there was an unknown gap of time between verse 1 and verse 2 of the first chapter of Genesis, allowing for many Christians to hold to the antiquity of the earth. Okay, I, I wouldn't use the Schofield Reference Bible as, a, as an example. I, I don't know if anybody's aware of the, the history of dispensational theology. I myself hold to Reformed theology, covenantal theology. Dispensational theology is what a lot of people look at today as a very sloppy interpretation of the scriptures. I wouldn't hold uh, the Schofield Reference Bible as, as an example for, for anything. Prior to the 1960s, most who described themselves as creationists held to either the gap theory of Genesis or a day-age theory. Okay, that's a biased comment. Even in the famous Scopes trial, the creationists were not young earth creationists. William Jennings Bryan, the prosecutor in the case, was a proponent of the day-age theory. Bryan even wrote to Howard Kelly, stating that he had no theological objections to evolution prior to the appearance of humans. So what happened? Why today is the word creationist synonymous with young earth creationists? And if young earth believers were a minority 100 years ago, even among self-proclaimed creationists, why do they appear to be a major group among Christians today and have so much influence? Okay, so this again is where he, he kind of concludes his presentation suggesting that young earth creationism is a modern phenomena. We've already kind of talked about this at nauseum. It's not but he's presenting it like this, and he's actually going to the lengths in this stage of his video to link young earth creationist arguments, at least the modern ones, to a couple of cultish fringe groups in the Seventh-day Adventist and the Millerites. So there you go. In the first half of the 20th Cute century, how he has a pacifier there was here, only one group the young earth that was mostly comprised of young earth creationists, which was the Seventh-day Adventist movement. The Seventh-day Adventists were considered heretical for claiming things like Sunday worshipers would be given the mark of the beast and for you elevating think? the visions of their prophetess, Ellen G. White, to be on par with scripture. The Seventh-day Adventists were a very charismatic group that broke off from the Millerite movement of the 19th century. So, so what is he asserting here? I'm just trying to, it seems like he's kind of saying that all young earth creationists today are like descendants of cultish fringe groups. I mean, is it like, I went to a Presbyterian seminary I'm a reformed person, an academic, and I believe in a literal six days, as do a lot of people. There's a lot of academic, a lot of people who I'm sure are more highly educated than uh, the person producing that video that believe in a literal six days. Are they the product of cultish fringe groups? I mean, I'd say it's the other way around, if anything. Their leader, Ellen G. White, claimed she received visions from God where she was taken back to oh, the creation okay. and saw that everything was created in six literal 24-hour days. Then the world was destroyed in a global flood that laid down the rock layers we now have. Among this view, I, I don't know if I covered this already or not, but this view has been taken historically by the majority. Uh, you can go back to the 1600s. There's a man by the name of Steno. He's the father of modern geology. And his take was that the rock layers were flood layers, and that the the fossils we find there were the results of the dead animals buried in the flood, which there's really no other way to fossilize something than to bury it rapidly by water. So, so this is just straight up wrong. She wasn't the first one to suggest this argument. Among the Seventh-day Adventists was a man named George McReady Price, who was something of an armchair geologist. He wrote several papers and books <laughs> arguing the geological column was the result of Noah's flood. So all the rock layers that demonstrated the antiquity of the earth were really laid down during Noah's flood. He called this flood geology, and he also taught the earth was only 6,000 years old and everything was created in six days. Many arguments modern young earth creationists use date back to Price and not actual geological specialists. For instance, Price appears to be one of the first who incorrectly claimed the geological column was based on circular reasoning where the rock layers were dated by their fossil content 
Okay, the geologic column is based on circular reasoning, reasoning and, and I already talked about this, that you have supposedly rocks that are millions of years old with soft tissue in them. It's impossible. And when they find evidence like that that contradicts their theories, then they'll say, well, we know these fossils are this old because the rocks are that old. Well, how do you know the rocks are that old? Because there's fossils that are that old in them. So that's, it's this circular, there is circular reasoning involved in it if you actually study it. And fossils were used to date rock layers. He also, like modern creationists, appealed to 2 Peter 3, where it talks about scoffers coming in the last days. And he interpreted this to being a reference to modern evolutionists. He also so th this is where it veers off. And this drives me crazy because I feel like people who want to debunk a young earth creationist will look at some extreme examples of those who maybe wear tinfoil hats or don't believe in dinosaurs or just say that you're a scoffer if you're not a young earth creationist. I don't know any young earth creationists that just call people scoffers because they believe in evolution. I don't. I think it is a misguided proposition for how life began on earth. Personally, I, I think it's straight from the pit of hell in order to, to lead entire generations of people astray. And that's exactly what it's done. It's undercut the authority of the Bible. Are you evil for believing in that? No, no. I think you're misguided. I don't think you're evil. I don't think you're a scoffer. And so I don't see what this, what does this do? So he, he called people scoffers. We're, we're not, now we're not talking about the actual evidence. We're looking at character assassination. I mean, we can go throughout history and talk about character assassination. We can go through the proponents of evolution and talk about character assassination. There's plenty to be had there. We can look historically and maybe make an argument for how evolution led to the Holocaust, among other things. How evolution led to the Soviet Union and the gulags, at least atheistic evolution. So I, I just don't see the value in character assassination. It takes away from what could be a solid argument on his part. So utilize Exodus 20, 11 to argue the creation week had to be a normal seven day week. He is the basis for other common creationist arguments famously touted by Ken Ham and others. Price okay. said, geologists and pale uh, Again, I belabor my point. He is not the basis of these arguments. These are historical arguments. These are historical arguments. You could maybe just say that the creationists have just been keeping up with the evolutionists and developing these more detailed responses, just like evolutionists have been developing their own more detailed arguments for things. Paleontologists looked at their facts through the colored spectacles of Darwin and Lyle. And likewise, creationists also look at the world through the lens of scripture. Therefore, any data used to support evolution can also be used to support young earth creationism. Price also promoted ideas that are not used by modern creationists, and some were quite racist. He claimed that there was a... Uh, okay, Darwin promoted racist ideas in The Origin of the Species. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of that, but uh, suggesting that the darker-skinned people were closer in ancestry to the apes. So I, I think the point is racism is an inherently human thing. It's a result of our sinful and wicked human hearts that want to judge other people. It's a terrible tendency on our part. But again, we're back to character assassination. I don't see what alleged racism has to do with anything. I mean, I think if anything, you could make the argu argument that evolution is an incredibly racist theory at heart. Rapid degradation after the Babel incident of Genesis 11, which produced darker skin colors. This also produced Neanderthals, other hominids, and possibly even the great apes. But the price's credit, unlike modern creationists, he didn't claim the universe was 6,000 years old, only that the Earth and life on it was. But this was because Ellen G. White claimed that she saw in her visions other planets with life that existed before Earth. So the Seventh-day Adventist creationists only argued for a young Earth, not a young universe. Ronald Numbers notes, Price's ideas were mostly rejected by the fundamentalists of his day. By the 1920s, Price had found few followers. Numbers says, Before about 1970, the few disciples of Price brave enough to enter graduate programs in geology, usually found evolution so pervasive, they either abandoned geology or discarded flood geology. Yeah, they were bullied. But all that changed in the coming decades. In 1954, Bernard Ram wrote a book where he exaggerated the influence of Price and criticized Price's flood geology and the younger stance. 
Okay. The point of his book was to encourage Christians to abandon views like the gap theory and young earth creationism and hold to progressive creationist interpretations. Unfortunately, Ram's book had the opposite effect. The book sparked a young theologian named John Wickham Jr. to write his doctoral dissertation as a response and a defense of Price's young earth views. After this, Whitcomb looked to get his dissertation made into a book, but publishers wouldn't take it up because Whitcomb had no scientific credentials. So he sought out a scientist who would not only endorse his work, but would also co-author a book arguing for a young earth. He sent his manuscript to geologists, all of which rejected the invitation, pointing out that geological evidence could not be used to support a young earth. Eventually, Whitcomb contacted Henry Morris, who was not a geologist, but he did have a PhD in hydraulic engineering. Morris agreed to co-author the book, but both Whitcomb and Morris were embarrassed to admit they were recycling many of Price's old arguments, because the scientific community had already considered Price's arguments and had rejected them for decades. So they worked to distance themselves from Price while utilizing many of his arguments for a young Earth. However, they also argued the universe was young, being that they were not followers of Ellen G. White, and put forward many arguments creationists still use today, like the idea that before the Flood, there was a great vapor canopy that surrounded the Earth and created the long lifespans listed in Genesis 5, and was responsible for altering modern radiometric carbon-14 dating. So there's a lot of creationists at that stage, young earth creationists, people who believe in a literal six-day creationist account, which, by the way, we, we shouldn't necessarily equate young earth creationism with just the six literal days for reasons that I already explained, because there's a lot of people who don't believe in evolution. I've even heard some Christians say that basically days four, five, and six are literal days, but before that, you know, they, they fudged the numbers a little bit in the creation of uh, the sun, the moon, and the stars. So I can honestly care less where somebody falls on some of those things. But there were some people who took a literal view of Genesis that developed this canopy theory, a crystalline ice canopy that was covering the earth and shrouding the earth. Uh, that, that was their way of talking about how carbon-14 was different before the flood and how sometimes you can get large numbers, 40,000 years or 60,000 years from carbon-14 dates. I don't think these are big hurdles to be overcome personally, because I still think 40,000 years is a lot different than 4 billion. And secular scientists have to explain why supposedly 40,000-year-old carbon-14 samples are in rocks that are 60 million years old. It's circular reasoning. A lot of young earth creationists have abandoned this idea. I don't believe in a crystalline canopy. I mean, I'm open to anything, but I, I don't personally believe in it. I think the flood created some extraordinary circumstances. The catastrophic plate tectonics that were at work in causing the flood, the things that we see evidence for in the geologic column, I think that created some extraordinary circumstances for all forms of dating things that we see not only in terms of things that were once living, fossilized remains, but also in terms of determining the ages of rocks. And there's a lot of studies out there that show how the dating methods they use for these things create contradictory results. So the crystalline canopy, I mean, it is what it is. I don't think a lot of people even believe in that today, even within the young earth creationist perspective. But, you know, why not generalize all of us into one category here? At the time, they could not find a geologist with a PhD to review and endorse the book. But nonetheless, they went forward and in 1961, the Genesis Flood was published. Experts familiar with Groundbreaking Price books, were by the quick way. to catch that the book was simply rehashing many of Price's old arguments. Whitcomb and Morris, instead of being dragged into the scientific debate, stated, the real issue is not the correctness of the interpretation of various details of the geological data, but simply what God has revealed in his word concerning these matters. Despite the scientific community rejecting their thesis, there wasn't a strong effort to pass this message on to the populace that lacked the scientific knowledge. And in the first decade, the book sold around 10,000 copies. And in 25 years, it sold around 200,000 copies. Morris and Whitcomb became celebrities and were invited to travel around the world to speak at various colleges, churches, and conferences promoting their young earth interpretation. As they would have been, and I would imagine that if a lot of people believed in these things, they would want to hear this. So again, this kind of goes against the argument that this is a modern phenomena, that this whole thing of young earth creationism. It seems like really there's always been a lot of people who have believed this and uh, they want to study the science on it. And when there are people that study the science on it and they find evidence for it, people 
They want to hear about it. Soon after the publication of the book, the Creation Research Society was formed. They could not find a geologist to join their cause, but Clifford Burdick had some training in earth sciences and joined the committee. Morris also helped to form the Institute for Creation Research, which still promotes young earth creationism to this day, and in part, helped to give rise to Creation Ministries International and Answers in Genesis. By the 1990s, the word creationist became a term synonymous with young earth creationists. I don't know that that is actually true. And, and he's made that statement multiple times throughout this video because I don't think creationist means young earth creationist. I think creationist just in its simplest definition means that you believe in creation as opposed to random natural processes. In other words, you're not an atheist. You don't just believe that things happen by chance. That's how I take creationist. So I, I absolutely think somebody could be a creationist and believe in lots of years. You, you, in a liberal sense, could be a creationist and believe in evolution, although I think that's stretching the definition a little bit. That's not my experience that creationist means young earth creationist. I think it can sometimes have that connotation, but that by no stretch means that it is always understood in that way. That's my experience. This interpretation of Genesis, which had been a tiny minority position among anti-evolutionists in the 1920s. Oh, minority position, fringe group. By the 1970s, the very definition of creationism. If one said he or she were creationists in the middle 1970s, friend and foe alike would have assumed that that person was a young earth creationist. See, I just think this is a faulty interpretation to begin with because I think the reality of it was more along the lines of the mass populace assumed that the Bible was true for, at least in Westerndom, we did. And then along comes evolution and, you know, people just don't have a certain conviction about it per se. And a lot of people, you know, a lot of people in the middle were like, oh, okay, okay, you know, that's fine. Maybe, maybe that is how we came to be because they didn't really think about it or process it that much. But the more the idea was advanced and the more success that it had in culture meant that at some point it had to be confronted by those adhering to a biblical worldview. And I think that's what you see happening. That's why people started to push back at a certain point. I, I think that's a more rational way of looking at what's happened culturally. Now, I'm not saying there were no young earth creationists before the Seventh-day Adventists. Okay, but you did. <laughs> Don't backpedal. Many believe the earth was relatively young. But with the rise of fields like geology and paleontology, the majority of Christians that left writings behind abandoned young earth ideas. Writers before the rise of modern science based their dating of the earth on the most up-to-date research of the time. The Christian reaction to the rise of modern science was at first mostly welcoming. It wasn't until the 20th century that still is. my fear that paleontology and evolution would do away with the Bible that the modern creationist movement began. At first, the anti-evolutionists were mostly old earth creationists. But over time, as evolution became more supported by the evidence and the anti-evolutionist push seemed to be gaining little ground, my suspicion is the reaction to evolution became more fanatic. And so many Christians began looking for alternatives to the old earth approaches that may have seemed like compromises to many laymen. But the modern movement did not come from an official church interpretation of Genesis that was dogmatically accepted before Darwin and was simply eroding away in light of modern sciences. It stems from Seventh-day Adventist apologists who based their belief in a young earth on the visions of Ellen G. White. Long before Darwin, Christians were interpreting Genesis in a plethora of different ways. The age of the earth was not a huge issue until very recently. So despite... You know, so what is the point? I mean, is, is the point of biblical interpretation to just say, well, there's a plethora of different ways to interpret this. So, you know, we can just interpret it however we want. Or do we want to discover the actual truth of what the passage is saying? What is the point? Because it almost sounds like the logic of inspiring philosophy is, well, there's lots of different interpretations. You can, you can do this, you can do that, you can pick this, you can add a little bit of this, sprinkle a little bit of this on it over here, and, 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 and it's all good. It, you know, it, it, it's like, are we trying to arrive at actual truth, or are we just creating a product of our own imagination? Because I can create a lot of products. I can imagine a world in which evolution is true. I don't think the science bears it out at all, but I can imagine it. The claim from organizations like Answers in Genesis they are not defending something that was pivotal to Christianity and undisputed before Darwin. Christianity has always been compatible with multiple interpretations of Genesis, and the modern okay. dogmatic adherence to a young earth 
really traces back to the vision Not sure what that of an alleged means. prophetess. Okay, so what is my take on this video on Michael Jones and inspiring philosophy, some of the things that he asserts in this video. My general reaction is just that I think this was uh, put together in an incredibly sloppy fashion. I'm somebody who went through academia. I actually have a doctoral degree, which means I understand the value of research and not generalizing not only the other side, but myself and my arguments. I sensed a lot of bias in this video, much of which I pointed out as we went along. Statements about the beliefs of those from history were taken out of context or just cherry-picked to open the door for modern interpretations, and I think you failed at that. Still coming to the conclusion that for the most part, the vast majority of the ancients, church fathers included, up until the time of Darwin, were Bible-believing, six-day, young earth creationists. That's my takeaway. I also didn't appreciate likening the doctrines of young earth creationism to cultish behavior, including your reliance on popularized mythology of the Schofield Reference Bible, which really amounts to bad theology. Again, I am not saying you aren't a brother in the Lord, and I do not say this to be condescending, but just for the sake of argument, because I would like you and others to see that there is a different side to the story. And there are a lot of people out there who would say that you have interpreted history incorrectly. So next time, do your homework, do a better job of putting your arguments together, and don't rely so heavily on character assassination. In the end, if you were just trying to prove that you can believe in evolution and be a Christian, then I would say maybe you've achieved that. But I'm trying to arrive at the actual truth of what the Bible teaches and science tells us about creation. I cannot, with a rational, sane human brain, see evolution as anything other than a fantasy. I would appreciate it if you didn't generalize all creationists as young earth and all young earth creationists as bigoted people who are just trying to put others down because we're not. Maybe we just want to know the truth a little more than you do. And we're more willing to rely on God and his perfect and flawless word. A word that all the ancients took literally to get us there. Hey, there's one more thing I've got to share with you. I want you to know that you know Jesus and that you will one day be resurrected and spend an eternity with him. The Bible says that all those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That all you need to do is confess Jesus with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. So just say this prayer with me right now. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner and I need a savior. I believe that you died for my sins and that you were raised to life three days later. Make me born again in my heart through the power of your Holy Spirit and help me to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer, you are saved. Now go get yourself a Bible so that you can begin to develop godly habits in your life and make sure to join a Bible-believing local church where you can be baptized as an outward symbol of what God just did in your heart. If you don't have a copy of the Bible, send us a message and we'll get one to you. Welcome to the family, friend.